I do believe that tonight can be transformative. I do believe that tonight is a big idea whose, I, whose time has come. And it is based on what our Health Studies Collegiate Foundation specializes in, which is rethinking health from the patient's point of view, rethinking health as a primary, proactive, personalized prevention. If you like onomatopoeia, I could go on with these. Uh, but my personalized, primary, proactive prevention is something that is evidence-based if you use very specific tests called predictive biomarkers, and you throw away the lab ranges, and you replace that with the best outcome goal values, and now you can know two very important things. What it is that will likely help you to live 10 or more years well, and at the same time, feel better tomorrow. And if you're not at your goal value, because we know that some people are not at their best outcome goal value, I'll bet some people in this room are not at their best outcome goal value. If you're not, we can tell you what to do in regard to what you eat and drink, think and do, to bring yourself to that goal value, usually within months, based on your what's called biochemical individuality. Everybody in this room has a unique face and fingerprints, and I say you have a unique metabolism. We now talk about the microbiome and the metabolome. We used to just talk about digestion and metabolism, but today they pay you more if you say microbiome and metabolome. <laughs> and we can talk about any of that stuff. Why? Because I'm kind of curious, eclectic, and rather cross-trained. Uh, and um, let's see if I can, yeah, let's see. Well, who, who am I? Here I am. Yep, that's me. Um, so I'm a clinical pathologist. I'm a clinical nutritionist. I'm a scientific fellow of the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. Uh, I'm a fellow of the Clinical Immunology Society, the Medical Laboratory Immunologist, and overseas fellow of the Royal Society of Medicine. Um, you have to, in order to uh, be recognized as a fellow, which is you know a certain status within the profession. Uh, in more than one uh, discipline. Uh, you either have to be very um, curious uh, or have a Jewish mother, uh, or both, or both. Uh, I did help found the Health Studies Collegium because we thought it was time to have a consumer-driven health uh, in, uh, institution, uh, a place that uh, focused on integrative science, uh, and I decided uh, to apply what uh, scientific capacities I had uh, in improving Supplements, a new category of super premium, higher uh, quality, all active supplements, Perk Integrative Health, Eliza Act Biotechnologies, an immunology lab that does cell cultures more precisely than most labs do blood sugar and blood cholesterol, and then a drug a development company that uh, has a hypertension candidate that hopefully you will hear about. Um, and what we're going to really talk about tonight that it applies to each of you and to all of us. Aha, uh -huh, who wants to go back? Well, I want you to go back. There, yeah, thank you. Let's rethink health together. Let's use these predictive biomarkers. Are, well, what are predictive biomarkers? They are tests that tell us something that can allow therapy to be modified. And the most predictive ones are the ones that tell us far ahead. And then, quite surprisingly, they give us information about how to feel better tomorrow how to be your own doctor much of the time, and how to know the limits of that. And the goal is for evidence-based care, the triple aim, as my colleague Don Berwick talks about it, better health, better care, lower costs. Well, I want to add life to years and years to life. Uh, and that's not just a platitude. Uh, I can tell you in the case of my own dad, uh, his uh, nutrition growing up in, you know, in childhood uh, was so poor, so poor, that he had what's called the nutritional cirrhosis. He had scarring of his liver because of inadequate nutrition as a child. We had him till 90 years, in part because we were very attentive to making sure his liver was happy as best it could, and we didn't stress it too much. And that's something of a simplification, but not much. So you can improve health outcomes. You can get better health and better outcomes at lower costs and risks. And what you need is what I'm going to now talk about, which is these uh, predictive biomarker, 
high sensitivity predicted by a marker test. There are eight of them. We're going to talk about them in a variety of different ways. So I'm introducing and in essence telling you everything I'm going to tell you tonight. I've already told you. And now we're going to go back and get into some of the particulars and maybe answer some questions that you might have. So if you look, starting at the top in the green rectangle, you see a test called hemoglobin A1C, HGB A1C, hemoglobin A1C. And that has to do with converting sugar with the benefit of a hormone called insulin into energy. Then you have HSCRP, C-reactive protein. This is about inflammation and repair deficit. That's a big deal in every aspect of health and, uh, and health care today. Then homocysteine, we're coming around clockwise. Homocysteine in the kind of orange box. This is about methylation, detoxification. This is about moving molecules around. This is about being able to repair. Another big deal. Then HSLRA, the high sensitivity lymphocyte response assay. And that gives us information about your immune system, what you're tolerant to, and what you react against what burdens your immune system and prevents you from repairing as much as you need to. Uh, and by the way, your immune system is responsible for immune and defense, but also for taking care of any cancer cells that form. And the news is that everybody makes cancer cells every day, but fortunately we have anti-cancer mechanisms as long as our immune system isn't preoccupied with too much defense work. These four, the first four, hemoglobin A1C, HSCRP, homocysteine, HSLRA, they have every quality, and they've been done long enough on every socioeconomic group and every geographic area and every uh, type of environment. Uh, and they're absolutely ready to qualify as these predictive biomarkers. Now I'm going to offer four more that I think are candidates that over the next probably five to 10 years, I think will be validated and fill in all of the epigenetics. Remember, 92% of your health is choice. 92% of your lifetime health is epigenetic and lifestyle-based. And only 8% is choosing your parents and, and genetics. So the other four tests, if you continue clockwise, you see the yellow rectangle is first AM urine pH. The amount of acid in your urine after rest tells us a lot about what's going on inside your cells in regard to minerals like magnesium and potassium. And they're not just names. They're really critical to activate the catalysts. And if you want your get up and go to come back and stay, you need to have, among other things, you need to have enough magnesium and potassium inside the cell. So first morning you're in pH. This is something you do at home yourself. Cost pennies a day. Vitamin D. We have here uh, our uh, session chairman, Dr. Grant, who's really one of the true world's experts and advocates for healthy vitamin D levels, and we'll talk some about that, but he can, uh, by all means, teach me. Um, then the omega-3 index. This is uh, Bill Harris's test, the test of omega-3 balance, uh, because we need both kinds of essential fats, but almost all Americans get way too much omega-6 from our edible oils uh, and far too little omega-3. And I want you to have more omega-3 and less omega-6. And I'll tell you, if you want, how to do that. And then the last, the eighth one, uh, is the uh, kind of royal blue or teal blue. And that's an adoxoguanine test. It's a urine test. It's a measure of oxidative damage in your nucleus, in your DNA. And I don't know about you, but I want to know if my DNA is being damaged oxidatively. And it's a non-invasive urine test. These are the eight biomarker tests. They cover all of epigenetics. What we add is the goal values, these best outcome goal values. And if you're not at your goal values, what to do about it. But what you see on the left is that 92%, this is on the bottom left, 92% of lifetime health is choice in epigenetics. 8%, that's on the top, 8% uh, is genetics, is you know, your DNA. And both of these influence gene expression. And by the way, your genetic sequence today and your genetic sequence in five and 10 years are not going to be the same. Genes really do jump around. They really do change. There is a lot we are beginning to learn about how dynamic are the genes, uh, and that just picking little points and measuring them is probably not necessarily a good idea. But what I am suggesting is these predictive biomarkers, the eight that we've just talked about, 
that you can use these before subclinical disease or when people have chronic disease and you can guide care in the most uh, effective, most evidence-based, uh, least risky, lowest cost, but most uh, um, personalized of ways. So we pay a lot of attention uh, to what people are eating and drinking and thinking and doing, uh, and that's our initial. On to one of the specific examples we talked about. This is a very popular test. It's very commonly done. Uh, it's a hemoglobin A1C. Uh, so it happens that this is about regulating insulin and blood sugar. It has to do with your liver and your muscles and your this and your that and your pancreatic cells, but you can look at that offline if you are interested. But here's something very important to take away, and this is something that many colleagues use uh, with their practice. On the left, you see the green zone, which says, if you have a less than 5% hemoglobin A1C, you have a more than 99% chance of living 10 or more years. That's good. And what about if you're on the other end, the red side? And I've seen hemoglobin A1Cs above 12%. You have a less than 1 in 5 chance of living 10 years, and it's a choice. Now, yes, this is related to diabetes, but please understand that diabetes kills and diabetes causes, but diabetes is a choice. If you keep your blood sugar in a healthy range, you don't have the complications. You remain a diabetic. It's not like, oh, I'm no longer a diabetic. <clears throat> but David Rothbard and others have shown if you keep your blood sugar in a healthy range and zone, you don't have the complications of diabetes. And we have what we recommend as a basically natural herbal combination that includes banaba, chlorosolic acid in a standardized form, agnus castus, then a variety of uh, synergistic uh, herbs like bitter melon and mara and French lilac, and then chromium in the citrate form and vanadium in the ascorbate form, and certain amounts, and these are all available in a single mycelized soft gel. And the number of soft gels you take is based on your hemoglobin A1C or your blood sugar. And the goal is to bring your blood sugar into the healthy uh, range and keep it there. Because then your hemoglobin A1C is less than 5%, and then you have a more than 99% chance of living 10 or more years. There are some common questions that are asked about this hemoglobin A1C and its a kind of a natural approach. Uh, it turns out that each one of these, uh, the chlorosolic acid has been used in the Philippines uh, by uh, traditional healers for many um, hundreds of years, as far as I can tell. Uh, Agnes Castus, uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, is actually to uh, create more resilience in the pituitary, so it isn't specifically to lower blood sugar, but if your pituitary is more stable and happy, then your blood sugar is more stable. Uh, French lilac, uh, bitter melon is mentioned in the Old Testament, the, the, the Mara. Uh, so here you can, some of these go very far back in antiquity. And the key from our point of view is to have a standardized form uh, and a form that's probably mycelized to enhance uptake. Uh, and then you can have confidence uh, that uh, what you're taking is um, historically based, uh, is observationally evidence-based. Uh, and uh, if you follow the companies that follow good manufacturing practices, such as the kinds of things I'm involved with, you get the benefit of pharmaceutical quality, uh, but also nature's pharmacy. And uh, then you can add one more piece, which I do urge uh, people and companies to do. Only use the form shown beneficial in an outcome study. So if there's a mixed natural form, say of folate or vitamin E, use the mixed natural form, because that's the one that's safer and shown beneficial in clinical studies. The work of ice, the single synthetic form of vitamin E or folate or whatever, I don't think the work of ice works, so I don't really recommend them. I do recommend nature, nurture, and wholeness, and that's a principle, but I apply that through using the natural forms, the safer, more uh, beneficial, I believe, safer, more beneficial forms of nutrients. So, if we may go um, to the next uh, biomarker, which is the uh, HSCRP, high sensitivity C reactive protein. When the body needs to repair, something called inflammation happens. And in the last several decades, inflammation has become linked at the cellular molecular level to almost every 
illness, almost every autoimmune, chronic, degenerative, even the most acute illnesses, uh, have an inflammatory component recognized today. When the body has a repair deficit, it cries for help, and in the chemical way, uh, the chemical that is the cry for help is this C-reactive protein. It's reactive, it's inducible. When you need repair, this protein comes into the blood, and you can measure it there. Then Paul Ritker and colleagues uh, looked at this in relation to uh, heart risk, and they learned that at the low end, there's a lot of interesting information. So they developed the high sensitivity version of C-reactive protein, sometimes called the cardio uh, CRP, but it's not heart specific. It's total body. Uh, and it's an assessment of inflammation, of repair deficit. And if we just look at the cardiovascular piece, Two Americans die every minute of avoidable cardiovascular events. That's 550,000 a year. And of those, 500,000 are from complications of diabetes. So most of the people, they get heart attacks, strokes, atherosclerosis, et cetera, uh, have one or another form of diabetes. And then there's about 50,000 people that have other kinds of cardiovascular problems. And we know the goal value. The goal value for C-reactive protein is less than 0.5, and we'll talk uh, later about, in summary, about uh, these goal values and why they're so valuable. But let's look at inflammation. It's now related, if you look on one side of the slide, it's related to autoimmune diseases from arthritis to diabetes, and that includes, by the way, eczema and psoriasis and multiple sclerosis and migraine headaches. And it's related to cardiovascular disease and cancer, to pulmonary diseases and to neurological diseases from Alzheimer's to prion diseases. And many scientists today uh, will tell you that Alzheimer's senility is actually diabetes of the brain. And when you combine work like Giuseppe Lugami's on prion diseases and Alzheimer's or neurologic uh, diseases uh, with imbalances in sugar, insulin, energy conversion, I think it makes a very strong case that we should keep our blood sugar uh, in, our, in our systemic circulation, in our blood circulation, but also in our brain. Because by the way, your brain runs off of glucose. Don't doubt that glucose is the fuel for your brain. Your brain knows that it needs glucose, but it only needs a little bit at a time. Too little is too little, of course, and too much is too much. I'll bet you heard that as a, as a child. It's really true. You want the equivalent of the middle path. You want just right. You don't want too much, because more is not better. You don't want too little, because too little is really too little. We can now tell you how much is enough. And here I'm going to give you an example. It's called the C-Cleanse, and this is how to find out how much ascorbate and vitamin C you need. But I'm going to call it ascorbate because it's not a vitamin. It is really a substrate. It's really a protective antioxidant that sacrifices itself so that all the other antioxidants can be regenerated. And if you want to know how much you need, we recommend that if you're healthy, you take a gram and a half every 15 minutes or six grams an hour until you cleanse. Uh, if you're moderately ill, twice as much. If you're chronically ill, you might start with two teaspoons, which is six grams every 15 minutes. That's 24 grams. And that 24 grams is 24,000 milligrams, if you do the math. Uh, and in two hours, that would be 48 grams. And most people will cleanse within two hours at that level. The point I'm making here is you may be familiar with bowel tolerance. This is the next generation after. Here, you rapidly ramp up and saturate the system with quality ascorbate. Then the ascorbate energizes the rectum, pumps fluid and schmutz and toxic matter into the rectum, and it comes whooshing out. Some people say it's like peeing from your butt. I don't say that, but some people say that. Okay. Now, here's a few thousand people who told us how much ascorbate it took for them to cleanse. And so on the far left, you see the yellow. That's the healthy people. It took them four grams or less to cleanse. That's just what you would expect. People who have very few symptoms, five to 10 grams. The average 80% uh, between uh, 10 and 120 plus grams. And about one in 20 people needs even more. Do we need more ascorbate today than 20, 50, 100 years ago? Yes, dear, we do. And why? Why? Well, because the oxidative stress from, oh, no, the oxidative stress comes from breathing the air, eating the food, drinking the water, having a 
restructured life and style and certain stresses in life. <clears throat> These are each and all contributors to increasing the ascorbate you need, and the amount you need is critical because, and here's another secret, this is an open secret, but this is a secret. If you get 100% of what you need, you get 100% of the value. But if you get, say, 50% of what you need in a score bank, you'll get like one quarter of the value. So life is not linear. Life is biological and geometric. And what it says is, locking it all together, doing all the things that are needed is really very smart, and you get an enormous synergy of benefits when you get what you need. And then the question has long been, what, how much do you need? Do you want to measure plasma ascorbate every morning? No, 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 we're not going to do that. So we developed a C-Cleanse uh, that's been in use for uh, about 25 years, I think, now. Uh, it is the next generation after bowel tolerance, if you're familiar with Bob Cathcart's work on that. And he was a terrific guy who was in this area for many years. Um, uh, but now I want to move to a more practical aspect, because if you need more ascorbate based on your cleanse, you also need other essential nutrients, such as flavonoids and flavanols, the colorful polyphenolics in the superfoods and fruits. You know those dark fruits and foods that are superfoods and fruits? They really are. They really are. And I prefer them really vine ripe. When you take a raspberry or a fig, off the vine from your front yard in the afternoon after it's been in the sun or in the morning when you just tiptoe out at dawn. It's a mechaya. Now, do I have to translate mechaya for this audience? No, it's okay. All right, it is. So polyphenolics are the colorful aspects of foods and they work synergistically with ascorbate. If you need more ascorbate, you need more of the polyphenolics. And kind of the pearl here, the clinical uh, insight, uh, is that we're going to protect and activate structural repair. If you want your bones and large blood vessels and joints and so forth to repair, then you need what I'm talking about. And you need the amounts that the C-Cleanse and the guidance we would provide uh, would provide you. In addition, ascorbate and polyphenolics are nature's antihistamines. And this is naturally steroid sparing, which means your native hormones, the hormones your adrenal and other glands make, will go farther. And oh, by the way, there's a further synergy of benefit. You activate elective protective mechanisms when you have enough ascorbate. Ascorbate detoxifies, like from toxic metals. Have any of you heard that drinking water in a city called Flint might have some lead in it? Have you heard that 2,000 towns around America, at a minimum, have too high a lead level? I was watching, this was some months ago, but I was watching a hearing, Capitol Hill, this was on C-SPAN, I believe, pediatrician is testifying, the chairman of the committee says, doctor, what is the safe level of lead and mercury in the blood? And the doctor said, by the time we see it in the blood, it's too late. And I'm going to translate that because Metallothionine, there is a sponge that the body makes to protect itself from toxic metals when the body is energetic and has all the things it needs. But that's an elective item. It is only done when the body is in high energy mode. And, gosh and golly, many people are in survival mode. Why? Because they lack the essential nutrients, they have too much distress and not enough eustress, uh, and uh, I'm going to stop for just a moment and tell a brief story about that. Uh, Sir Hans Selye is known to be the father of stress, and I had the privilege of being on a program with him. Uh, and afterwards, I went and asked him for a critique of my talk. And he looked at me for a minute, and he said, you really want a critique and not a compliment. And I said, Professor Selye, you don't have time to give me compliments. I want a critique. And he, te he, he gave me some very specific suggestions of how I could do better, but then he said, I don't think everyone in the audience felt they had a personal conversation with you. But I was there for Dr. Selye's talk, and I believe most of the audience had a personal conversation with Hans Selye. And he pointed out that there's a beneficial side to stress, and then there's a, quote, toxic side to stress. And what do you want? Not too little, not too much, just right, turns out, again, oh my gosh, to be just right. 
So ascorbate in adequate amounts can help chaperone toxic metals safely out of the body, and it enhances the body's recycling of the things the body needs to retain, and improves, if you want to, for example, improve glutathione levels in cells, the best way is to have enough ascorbate. If you want to make collagen and elastin and build the infrastructure of your bones and joints and large blood vessels, and I think that's a good idea, uh, ascorbate is the best way to do that. Um, if you want to keep your endothelial cells and your blood vessels happy, ascorbate is the benchmark as, as the, the protector of endothelial cells. So we know what the goal value is, it's less than 0.5, and in summary, what I'm saying is you should find out how much uh, the, your personal C cleanse need is, how much ascorbate you need. And yes, you can get some from uh, fruits and vegetables, but usually only a tiny fraction of what you need. Uh, if you're perfectly healthy, as I've said, four grams or less, and you can get most of that from a vitamin C rich diet. But if you need 50 grams or 100 grams, you're, I don't care how many oranges, I don't care how many vitamin C rich uh, beverages you consume, you, can't, you, you just can't do it without supplementation. The dark fruits, the superfoods, they really are, everything from pomegranates to raspberries. Uh, we have a, a permaculture biodynamic food forest in our front yard. We have a succession that I think starts with black raspberries, then moves on to blackberries and then raspberries. Uh, we have uh, some other fruit trees, uh, and it really is my pleasure, and it's my son's classroom, but it's my pleasure to sit there and watch the pollinators and the birds come by and go, and I find that uh, de-stressing rather than, uh, dis than, than distressing. Uh, you need enough B-methyl cofactors, and how much B-complex do you need to keep your urine sunshine yellow? You need biological detoxification, such as the ascorbates we talked about, but also fresh live greens, and they can be blended, they can be in a lot of ways, they can be lightly sautéed. But interestingly to me, uh, when you cook a food, usually the color gets brighter, and at peak taste it's at its brightest, but if you keep cooking even a little bit more, it's going to get dull. And what happens, and if anyone knows the kitchen chemistry of this, you can confirm this, what happens is the magnesium falls out of the chloroplast. Now the chloroplast in the plant is like the cytochrome in our battery of our mitochondria. And so as long as the magnesium is in place, the food is more nutritious and more colorful and more delicious. But as soon as you overcook it and the magnesium starts falling out of these little chloroplast things, now it gets dull and um, still it's got calories. You know, don't throw it out, but try to go for the natural uh, peak of color. Uh, high sulfur foods, and we will talk more about this, uh, but I want to introduce the concept that these sulfur foods should be staples in your diet, not condiments. Staples meaning you should have whole garlic bulbs uh, at a meal. And it's G-G-O-B-E is the easy to remember acronym that stands for garlic, ginger, onions, brassica sprouts, and eggs, G-G-O-B-E. Uh, and uh, these are the uh, detoxifying foods, you don't need all of them, but one or more of them should be staples in the diet. And by staple, I mean a whole onion as part of a meal, uh, a thumb-sized piece of ginger, uh, making ginger tea, uh, you know, as many broccoli sprouts as you want. <laughs> Turns out there's only so many broccoli sprouts you'll eat, <laughs> so don't worry about overdosing on the broccoli sprouts. Uh, and then eggs, and if you want to uh, have the optimum, then you try to get duck, goose, or quail eggs. Uh, but if it's a free range, omega-3 rich, you know, chicken egg, but sign the form and inform consent, it's okay. <laughs> uh, butyrates, things that you find in raw coconut oil and in clarified butter, we recommend. And the good fats, the omega-3 EPA, DHA, the active omega-3 fat, uh, to balance out uh, the excess of the diet. And I will tell you that in my home, we do not add oil to any cooking. So we have naked salads, and on the table we have aged balsamic, uh, a, you know, a grinder for black pepper, uh, Celtic sea salt, uh, and sometimes some other herbs or edible flowers, and people haven't complained. Uh, we cook with a lot of wine, that's my choice. You can cook with broth, 
okay, and, and I do sometimes go to the broth, but I like wine, and I don't want so much alcohol, but I like the taste of the wine, and you can actually, in most cases, you can replace the oil uh, with uh, the right amount of broth or wine. And then what happens? You have less fat as a percent of calories in your diet, just automatically. Now you don't have to compensate for the excess of omega-6 edible oil fats, um, and other good things as well. So, we want to, I think then, yes, we want to, just to keep on the schedule, we want to move on to this next biomarker, which is homocysteine. This is uh, from the 1960s, when a man named Kilman McCulley noticed that if your homocysteine was up, you had accelerated atherosclerosis and cardiovascular risk. Now we know this is an all-cause morbidity mortality uh, marker. This is a diagram, for those of you who are technical, about the homocysteine molecule and what happens when it's up and methionine is down, and therefore methylation is impaired, and therefore repair doesn't happen. And when repair doesn't happen, then a plaque forms. And when the plaque becomes vulnerable, you become vulnerable. And that's when, as the 2,000-year-old man says, your heart begins to attack you. So we recommend keeping the homocysteine level healthy and low, but having lots of sulfur sources in the diet. If you want to be more technical, it is the methionine to homocysteine ratio. So we really want methionine up and homocysteine down. That allows healthy methylation. We know the goal value is less than six micromoles per liter, and we know that homocysteine is related, of course, to cardiovascular disease, as you see in the upper right, but just go around clockwise. Osteoporosis and diabetes, and how about concentration and underachievement? Uh, uh, complications of pregnancy, uh, dementia, Alzheimer's. These are significant all-cause morbidity mortality uh, linkages with homocysteine. Now, homocysteine is an easy test to do badly. You must process it quickly because the homocysteine can leak out of the red cells, and then you have a high homocysteine level, but it's an artifact, and don't do that. Um, so you want to have a place that knows how to do homocysteine correctly, that processes it very promptly, uh, and they will probably take some time to tell you that you have to do this and we'll do that so we can give you an accurate value. Uh, there are commercial labs that can do a good job, including Quest and Lab One. There are also direct access consumer labs. But I would point out, you know, if you want to know the technical point, you must process a specimen within half an hour, otherwise the homocysteine significantly leaks out of the red cells and it will be higher than it is really, and you know, that will you know, create a concern that isn't needed. So with regard to homocysteine, aha, the GGOBE, the garlic, ginger, onions, broccoli, sprouts, and eggs. And by the way, in addition, in addition to the uh, high sulfur foods, uh, we highly recommend recycled glutamine. Now, glutamine is an energy source for the gut. If you want to repair the intestines, if you're concerned about digestion or stress affecting the gut or the gut nervous system, then you want to feed it glutamine because that is a source for a repair and energy. Recycle it with PAC so you never build up glutamate. You don't want the glutamate as an excitable neurotoxin, but you do want the benefit of the glutamine, and that's what we recommend as the recycled glutamine. Uh, so you stay physiologic and you uh, uh, get the benefit. Then, for example, we have developed uh, products that you dissolve under the tongue uh, before swallowing, like Perk Vessel Health Guard. Uh, this is the preferred natural form of B12 hydroxycobalamin uh, and B6 and some other mixed natural folates. Um, then there's Perk Liver Guard Forte. If your liver is in the shape most people's are and you want to support your liver, uh, and uh, for that, we have a very comprehensive formula. We have recently improved it uh, in a number of ways. It's a mycelized soft gel now uh, and uh, getting terrific reviews in reducing uh, elevated liver function enzymes, but uh, really it's designed to uh, promote better health in your liver. Uh, here's some evidence. These are three people who had high homocysteines, uh, took the vessel health guard, that is the product you dissolve under the tongue uh, before swallowing, and over just three months, uh, one came down from 13.2 uh, to about uh, 7.3 or something like that. All three came down in a very heartening way. 
and we're continuing to follow them and others to show that we can bring people to their best outcome value when they have everything they need and they don't lack anything that's essential. Now we move on to the fourth of the quartet of essential predicted biomarkers. This is about immune tolerance. I want to be tolerant. I hope you want to be tolerant. And in part, that means your immune system should be tolerant. Tolerant to what you're exposed to. Tolerant to what you eat. Tolerant to the air. <clears throat> tolerant to the world. And if you want to know whether you are tolerant, you have to talk to your lymphocytes. You have to talk to specialized white cells called lymphocytes. And you can do a lymphocyte response assay. It's something that my lab specializes in. And we can do now hundreds of these on a small sample and very accurately predict what you're tolerant to. And if you have lost tolerance, what you're intolerant to, what you react against, what is burdening your immune system and uh, uh, impairing you or, or promoting inflammation and repair deficit. So the immune system is a lot about balance. It's about uh, having uh, the ability uh, to neutralize and defend, the ability to repair, Mostly we do defense work during the day, and then we do repair work at night, so restorative sleep, really important. Uh, and also deleting abnormal cells. Uh, it, it is uh, many years from the time your anti-cancer mechanisms are impaired until cancer really uh, becomes present. Uh, for people like me, who have SV40 from uh, childhood, um, if we get small cancers, we can get big cancers. So people like me measure our anti-cancer mechanisms and make sure we keep them strong. You may hear about microbiomes, you know, the skin, the nose, the mouth, the lungs, the GI tract, each has a different constellation of healthy bugs. Um, the microbiomes are there uh, to be interdependent with us. It turns out there are more bugs in your body than the even cells. Uh, and so if we want healthy digestion, if we want to be resilient, if we want to be able to avoid most ill health, then we must have enough of the healthy microorganisms and their feeders, prebiotics, probiotics, and symbiotics, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that. For those of you who are more technical, there is an adaptive immune system. This is when the immune system has too much defense work and it needs to call in the reserves, and this can be done either naturally or artificially. Uh, but I just want you to understand that when you're healthy, you have no allergies. When you're healthy, you're tolerant. When you're healthy, you have 50 billion white cells. They're called granulocytes. You have 50 billion cells. They can neutralize infections and allergens that defends and repairs. And these 50 billion cells can each take in 50 or more uh, viral particles, bacteria, anything foreign to you, and recycle them when they have enough ascorbate and antioxidants and essential nutrients. So a really healthy person can get exposed and won't get sick. And a person who is really not so healthy but in survival mode might get a minimal exposure and then might get sick because they're hospital. With regard to these immune burdens, the delayed allergies come three hours to three weeks. So history is no good. And really, you must have a functional test because it's not uh, an antibody memory that's important here because uh, the antibodies could be helpful or harmful. Um, so I want to emphasize that you need to have some kind of a cell culture, particularly an ex vivo one, so that the cells react in the lab just as they do in the body. And we talk to the, to the lymphocytes, <clears throat> but just as they react in the body. And then we will say, these are the foods or chemicals or medicines to stay away from. Here's how to substitute for them. Uh, and here's how to evoke healing responses uh, by following the program. Uh, on the left, you see non-reaction. Tolerance on the left, intolerance and reaction on the right. Can you see the difference between the right and the left? I hope so. If not, have your eyes checked. <laughs> but I put this in because uh, sometimes folks say, oh, doing cell culture is it so hard and subjective. We just reported on over four years of consecutive blind split samples at the experimental biology meeting, a very uh, high precision meeting, high uh, profile meeting. Uh, and uh, we've always said less than 3% variance, which is excellent. Uh, but we were reporting 2.3% for the last four years, 4,300 blind splits, something like 150,000 cell cultures. Um, we are reproducible. We are consistent. Now, each person has to tell us whether we are helpful. And we leave that to the individual. 
and we unconditionally guarantee what we do, so we let you be the judge. So we recommend comprehensive functional and ex vivo testing. This does not measure the classic allergies. This does not measure type 1, IgE, or histaminic, but it does cover the functional harmful antibodies, IgA and G, and immune complexes and T cells, all in a single mixed cell culture. The T cells don't have any antibodies involved, and they're more important in these delayed immune reactions even than the antibodies. So you get the meaningful antibodies, immune complexes, and T cell reactions, um, and that's what we recommend. You can do, now if you need them, over 500 cell cultures on just one ounce of blood. We have the largest number of foods, additives, and preservatives, environmental chemicals, toxic metals, etc. We purify all the antigens ourselves, because that is a problem in the industry, uh, impurities in the commercial antigens. What a surprise. Uh, but I do have a background as a protein biochemist, and so we have always purified our own antigens, and that's part of why we get such precise results. We do recommend a health assessment questionnaire, an HAQ, a health assessment questionnaire. It can be done online or paper and pencil. Uh, and that gives us additional information about you as an individual, uh, and that can help guide us to which specific supplements, which specific activity and environmental recommendations, uh, whether a rotation diet option uh, would be helpful. And we have a, a book uh, just reprinted, it's 18th edition, The Joy of Living the Alkaline Way, uh, that includes much of this information uh, and that uh, many health professionals use and that folks uh, then take that home to reinforce the message so that um, you know, the wisdom that the doctor provides doesn't get lost in translation. Uh, this is what the personalized report looks like. This tells you what you're tolerant to, that's the good news, and what you're reacting against and what to do about it, including hidden, hidden places where you might find uh, these offending uh, foods and chemicals. The gut really is an issue. 75%, at least half, maybe three quarters of your immune system lines the GI tract, used to be called Peyer's patches. Uh, whatever it is, it's really important that the microbiome and digestion be in communication with the body's own immune defense and repair system. Now, if you want to know a global measure of how you're doing in terms of digestion in the microbiome, check your transit time. Check your transit time. And we have this online. Uh, you take charcoal capsules and you mark the time that you swallow them. And then when the black crumbly stuff comes out of your tush, you mark the time. And the difference in hours is your transit time. How long does it take from eating to eliminating? I've met people who said to me, but doctor, I, I evacuate every day. And I said, good, is it from yesterday or last week? <laughs> You'd be surprised how many people have a seven day transit time in America and they don't feel so well. So we want to substitute for the reactive items. We want to correct nutritional deficits. We want to initiate enhanced detoxification because of the burdens of 21st century living. And then we want to concentrate on individually evoking human healing responses. It really helps to walk the talk. Uh, we do outcome studies. Here's one in fibromyalgia, the most successful long-term study in fibromyalgia muscle pain. In just six months, 50% less pain, 70% less depression, 50% more energy, 30% less stiffness. And we've now done 10 and 15 year follow-up with these folks. They're continuing to do well or better. Uh, yes, every six months or a year, they repeat the testing to fine-tune. Uh, this was published in the Journal of Musculoskeletal Pain uh, some years ago. Uh, here's uh, some of the data from that same study. We normalize the data to begin. So if you look at the left, the before, they're all at 100, which is just a normalized number. And we're going to compare over time. And at three months, it looks like all three groups are doing better. But at six months, the magenta, the control group, has come back towards baseline. Uh, and they would continue to, to decline. Uh, the primary, the, the uncomplicated fibromyalgia, and the secondary complicated fibromyalgia continue to improve. And it's important to do studies at least six months long. Some things look very promising at two, four, or six weeks, or even at three months, 12 weeks. But there's also an awful lot of the uh, human healing response, the evocable placebo effect in that period of time. Look at the six month to 12 month data. And now we've been at this over 30 years in over 75,000 uh, cases, uh, so we're ready to talk about it. Uh, here's some other successful studies we've done, uh, type 1 and type 2 diabetes. 
on him just six months, starting from best standard of care. We reduced hemoglobin A1C by a full milligram percent. Uh, and in the type 2 diabetics, an 18% reduction in insulin levels, uh, which means less insulin resistance and better sugar insulin energy conversion. That we published in a diabetic medicine journal. Uh, this is data from both the type 1 and the type 2 studies. And this is the percentage of reactive uh, uh, items in each of those categories, you know, the people who reacted to, say, sweeteners or toxic metals or environmental chemicals. And you notice there's some similarity with some differences. Uh, if you look, for example, at the bottom, uh, cow dairy was very common as an immunoreactor, as a delayed allergen uh, for the uh, type uh, 2 diabetics, uh, but much less commonly for the type 1 diabetics. And our message is, you need to know for each individual the total burden. What is, what is the full range of foods and chemicals and environmentals that are burdening the immune system and substitute for as much as you can. You don't have to be perfect, and this turns out to be a very important point. If you had to be perfect, probably none of us would be alive. If you had to be perfect, you, you wouldn't get the response we see clinically in these studies. If you lower the burden below a certain threshold, the body can take care of the rest, especially if you give it what it needs. Put that to the test. I, I'm, I'm very confident that you will confirm what I've just proposed. Next, metabolic acidosis. This is that first morning urine rich. It's a big risk, that first morning urine test. Uh, it's your mineral status. Uh, and we know the goal value. You want to be in the healthy middle range. If you're acidic, less than six and a half, that means too little minerals, probably a deficit of magnesium and potassium into cells. Uh, the healthy range is six and a half to seven and a half, that's what you want. And you want to increase alkaline forming foods and minerals in the diet and supplement with minerals to bring that first morning urine after rest uh, into the healthy six and a half to seven and a half range. But you don't want it too high, because if it's too high, you might be cannibalizing your protein and losing ammonia in the urine and that's called catabolic illness. Not too high, not too low, in the middle, just right. Um, and the reason that we have this specific specimen is that after six or more hours of rest, the urine equilibrates with the cells in the bladder and the kidney, and so now you get a non-invasive measure of metabolic acidosis and mineral status. If you want to know about alkaline foods, the real physiologic effects of food effects on body chemistry, we worked that out many years ago, and it's a page uh, in the joy in living the alkaline way. Uh, you want more of the alkaline foods, uh, especially if you're repairing, and you want less of the acid-forming foods, but you can have a little bit. And it turns out that ionized magnesium plus choline citrate overcomes magnesium uptake block. Uh, and when you use that combination, tiny little droplets form that are taken up through neutral pores, even when the normal magnesium mechanism is poisoned. So we need magnesium, but very often getting it into people is hard, and it tends to run out as quick as it comes in. So that's why we developed a combination of perkmed plus garden perk choline citrate. So you enhance the uptake and then chaperone the delivery of the magnesium, and then the choline and the citrate are active and beneficial in their own right. And you take enough of that, enough doses a day, uh, to keep your uh, urine in the morning in a healthy six and a half to seven and a half range. Now, I mentioned that joy in living the alkaline way. You see that. And what's included includes information about alkalinizing foods and water, activity, first morning urine pH, and how to measure it, this magnesium choline citrate combination, but also relaxation responses and abdominal breathing and use of dichromatic green lights and sunlight, uh, and how to eat in harmony with your nature and lifestyle, uh, and how to eat locally grown and vine ripened or organic or biodynamically derived. Uh, if possible, uh, sources for your diet, and how to make restorative sleep a priority, and how to work your muscles and relax in proportion. So these are mostly um, ideas, high-level principles, uh, but we put them into practice for each individual by finding what people like to do, and we get them to do more of it. We give them incentives for virtuous behaviors. And lo and behold, people follow incentives. What a surprise. So exercise, rest, and recreation, or recreation. Uh, this is about the science of rest, which is also a wonderful little book by Ajaya and Valentine, because uh, there really is a science to breath, 
And interestingly, it's been discovered in India called prana or hatha prana yoga. Uh, in uh, China, it's uh, tai chi chuan. Uh, there are many moving meditations where breathing is an integral part. And so the science of breath is something we incorporate in everything we do. We recommend eating in harmony with nature. Uh, this is not my garden, I wish it was, but this is a lovely example of uh, what I believe is a biodynamic <coughs> garden. Biodynamic is like super organic. And so you feed the leaves and the roots, and you have plants living and growing together. You never till the soil. It's a whole system that my son specializes in uh, and that I highly recommend. It comes out of Anthroposophy and Rudolf Steiner's work, uh, which comes out of Goethe's work and Paracelsus before. If we move on to the next biomarker, it's vitamin D, 25-hydroxycholecalciferol. Vitamin D deficiency is important in almost every aspect of our body. Brain, lungs, pancreas, circulation, muscle, bone. And by the way, not a vitamin. Sorry about that. It's not a vitamin. It's a neurohormone. And it's a neurohormone that basically does this. It has two arms and it links to two adjacent cells, and it says, thanks for coming close, but stop dividing, we have enough. And if you understood what I just said, that a very low vitamin D would increase your cancer risk, and guess what it does? And we know what I recommend as a goal value, 50 to 80, other people have slightly different values, some people I think say 60 to 100. Um, but you want it to be higher than the average Americans is by a bunch. Uh, if you just walk down the street giving out vitamin D drops to people, uh, you'd improve the health of the country. Um, and notice I said drops because many people have enough atrophy or enteropathy or digestive problems that they don't absorb vitamin D very well from their gut. So they might be taking a lot but not getting much in. Under the tongue, uh, that mucosa, that tissue absorbs the vitamin D it goes to the brain first and then the body, and that's a good thing. Uh, and, and so that's what we recommend. Uh, this is Dr. Mike Hollick. He's been at vitamin D for a long time, vitamin D solution. He says take at least two to 3,000 IU of vitamin D a day from dietary sources, sensible sun exposure, and supplements. And we agree with that. Although what I now say is we know what the goal value is, 50 to 80 nanograms per ml. Take as many drops as you need to get to that level and measure every few months to make sure you're at the healthy level, not too high, not too low. Um, you can get four or 500 IU drops, um, and uh, you take as many of those as you need. I prefer the ones that are, have a little bit of rosemary oil as a natural uh, preservative. If you're concerned about inflammation CRP or interleukin 10 or insulin resistance, think about vitamin D and get your vitamin D up into the healthy range, and then think about the other things I talked about, because they all interrelate. Then essential fats, the omega-3 test. What is your omega-3 to 6 ratio? This has to do with what you eat. If you eat line-caught, deep water, uh, oily fish, then you're getting beneficial fats, but be careful because the fish swim in the ocean. And so if you're taking uh, essential fats uh, that are fish oil, Make sure they're distilled under nitrogen. And if you want to know whether they're distilled under nitrogen, the few companies that go to the trouble to do that and keep and protect the EPA and DHA and elements, uh, they spend so much money on it that they'll tell you they do it. You won't, you won't have to look hard for it. But I'm telling you, you want to have distilled under nitrogen because air oxidizes and damages these essential fats. Uh, and this uh, uh, next slide shows an example.